Well, it's nice to, to see you all. Thanks for joining. I think we've got, you know, 40 minutes or so scheduled and I'm going to try and beat you by 10 or 15 minutes there and leave time for any questions if we have them. I want to start by telling a quick story though. So just by way of introduction, uh, Ashley said this already. My name's Tyler Hogue and I lead the product org at Divi. I also lead our risk organization, which we've kind of combined into product because Divi is a credit card. We have a whole risk and compliance function that that I have the opportunity to lead without much experience there. Um, but I, uh, within product, we have product managers, product marketing actually rolls up to product, product design and product operations. And it's about 30 people total. And within risk, we've got about 25 people spanning across compliance and uh, underwriting and such. But the story I want to tell real quick is kind of how I ended up at Divi and how that kind of plays into the playbook I'm going to lay out today. So I joined Divi almost two years ago, and I joined from a company named Wealthfront out in the Bay Area. My wife and I lived in Redwood City. We loved it out there. We had no intention of leaving California. And then this guy named Blake Murray reaches out talking about Divi being a rocket ship and raising big rounds of capital. And I'd heard of Divi, but I must admit, I had some skepticism about leaving the Bay Area and coming back to Utah tech companies. Uh, I think it was fairly naive at the time, but I'll tell you what I thought at the time. I thought two things that I, I think, by the way, are now incorrect. Number one, I thought, I'm not so sure I want to be in Utah tech because it is, it is really, really sales driven and not as product driven. And what's funny is I do not mean that as a knock against sales. My background is actually in sales. I built sales team before I, I joined product. And so I have nothing against sales, but I had learned at Wealthfront that even if you're a salesperson, you want to work for a product led org because it makes your job easier. And that the best technology companies in the world are likely to be product led orgs. And I don't necessarily mean the person is a product led person. I mean, the literal organization is built on the back of a great product. And then the go to market function is fulfilling demand that the product can create. And then the second critique I have is all oh, those Utah tech companies are swinging for singles or doubles or triples. No one's really trying to hit a home run. Uh, and I have, I was drinking the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid of like, you know, million dollars isn't cool. Go for a billion dollars, that old line. And both of those are pretty naive and incorrect. And, and, I ended up joining Gibby soon after talking to Blake because I learned very quickly that Blake, Murray, and Divi thought about things differently than what I expected. Number one, they were planning to have a market leading product. And yes, we'd have a phenomenal sales function, but we want to build it on the back of a great product. And number two, uh, Divi has, has no shortage of ambition and is not trying to swing for a single or a double, but is really trying to build a multi-billion dollar business. And so I joined Divi two years ago and had a chance to kind of build the product function a little bit from scratch. We had four product managers, an awesome head of product uh, at the time, Jacob Graff, who now runs product operations. And I got the chance to come in and build upon what he and the rest of the team had already started. And today I'm gonna walk you through just five simple things that we kind of call the Divi product playbook. All of this was captured in a first round uh, review article about six months ago that they decided to do because I tweeted off a series of thoughts that were intentionally controversial. Controversial. And Brown caught wind of it and decided to uh, write an article about it. This is kind of a summary of those things. And I'm going to breeze through those five things here fairly quickly. All right. So I'm just kind of calling it the product playbook. What is the proper role of a product org? What's the right framing of the PM itself? How should the product org be organized? How should the product org be measured? And what's the right operating cadence? How do you actually execute against things? I'm gonna cover a lot of ideas and I'm just screenshotting a lot of our notion and just sh literally showing you how we do it at Divi for better or for worse. The first caveat is that a lot of this we do not do perfectly. We make a lot of mistakes and we've made a lot of tweaks to this playbook, but it's working and it's, it's, a, it's a fun playbook to run. So the first question, what's the right role of a product organization? You want to have her come down? I would assert that the first, the first role is to be product led. What does that mean? It means that a product person should be the directly responsible individual for all impact that, or all, all projects that impact customers or involve an engineer. 
Product led means you think about how the product can get, bury the or hold the burden of go to market and make sales' job easier. And we often fall short of this and the product will have a bug or something will occur that makes sales job harder. But in theory, a product led org is, is an organization that the product can, can generate demand through an awesome self-serve funnel and then pass off leads to a sales team. It has the features that the team needs in order to sell competitively. And it has the ability to retain customers in the product without there needing to be so much manual effort to retain them. So if we start from that pre premise of like, okay, be product led and being product led means like, make sure that product or someone is playing the product function who makes decisions on behalf of the customer. What is the right framing of the PM role? So you kind of have this as a spectrum. On one hand, you'll see PMs on an extreme thought of as a project manager. And, and you'll think of them as taskmasters, scrum masters, they're running JIRA. Uh, and on the other hand, you have this extreme statement of the PM is the CEO of their product. And so the second thing I'm gonna assert is that the right side is the side that you should be on. Now, there's gonna be caveats and nuance throughout all of this. Uh, the first is that when I say the CEO of the product, I recognize that that is a very flawed metaphor. Generally, no one is reporting to you as a product leader. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's a terrible metaphor being a CEO, but in a lot of ways, it's a perfect metaphor. You are the extreme owner. You have to balance multiple stakeholders. You have to both understand vision and execution. And so I'm of the opinion that the right side, the PM is the CEO of the product, is the right framing against which to create a product organization and against which to judge a PM. All right, so those are kind of the first two assertions that I'll make. Now let's uh, kind of re to reiterate this. The PM's responsible for driving outcomes for the business, period. This is something I learned at Wealthfront. It's like, there are times where I chip something, but to what Sorry, end? I don't know whether I was up. Anyone can ship software, right? Any idiot knows how to ship software, but to what end? It's so much better, right? Yeah, right. I feel like, and we'll probably iterate. Hey, so. Sorry, Milo and others, please, can you mute? Can everyone just mute their their things except Tyler? Sorry about that. No, no worries at all. I, I totally get it. Tyler, is there any way you could give one of us a the co-hosting co so that we can help with that? Yeah, even uh, being on my to the host. That'd be great. If yeah, not, sorry to, no worries. Sorry to interrupt. You want to teach me how to do that here? I've never done that before. Just go over to the the participants and there should be a drop down that allows you on the right to make a co-host. If it. not, that's okay. We can. I just made Ben a co-host and Ashley a co-host as well. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. right, Thank you. Me. No problem at all. All right. So you want this, I, I kind of view it as a little compromise that we think of PMs as a GM. Typically a GM is going to own a profit and loss, but I don't think that's typically the case within product, although at Divi, we kind of lean towards that a little bit and we'll have PMs actually own revenue numbers jointly with sales or we'll have PMs own new signup numbers jointly with marketing. Um, but uh, in, in other words, the GM model or the CEO model is the right model in my view to think about product. But there's a huge caveat here, a huge word of caution. If you're already thinking, man, this is a pretty product as God type framing, uh, let, let me try and pull that back a little bit. Just because someone is the directly responsible individual or someone is the GM of a product does not mean she is the uh, uh, usually the person who has the trump card on all decisions. I think anyone who is great at a product role recognizes that without the uninhibited support of an engineering lead, a design lead, and a product marketing lead, they will fail, period. This is not a product rules with an iron fist framework. This is a product is the one throat to choke type metaphor. However, any PM who loses the trust of, of his or her peers, it just will not succeed. And in fact, I also believe strongly with this statement made by Bill Campbell that the, the secret of all great technology companies is empowered engineers. It is the most important part of the recipe actually. And I know that seems like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. It's like empower PMs, but also empower engineers. Yes, engineers need to be running the show in some sense and great PMs will figure out how to make that happen. 
great PMs will figure out how to get engineers to care about outcomes and to align on customer problems and to get involved in customer discovery and to get involved in design. And the more you can empower your engineers to be your co-leads over an area, the better you will succeed as the GM of a product. And that shouldn't be surprising. It's true of a CEO as well. A CEO without the help of an executive team will fail. And so a great CEO finds ways to elevate those important roles around them. And that's my word of caution here. This is not a PM as a king type metaphor. Okay, so now we get into more nitty gritty. And this is where I hope it's a little more applicable to each of you. And I recognize we have some product leaders on the call. We have new PMs. We have senior PMs. We have people who run the gamut. But hopefully you'll find things that you can implement or experiment with at your organization uh, based on some of the failures and successes we've had at Divi. So how do we organize teams? The first is I want to set the framework for like, uh, and I'll actually tell another story here. It's an apocryphal story, meaning I'm not sure if it's true, but it's told enough that it's become true of JFK visiting NASA for the first time after announcing our mission to the moon. Uh, he went on site to meet with many of the engineers who were sending uh, our astronauts to the moon. And as he walked through NASA's facility, he came across a man who looked like a janitor. And President Kennedy walks up to him and says, hey, I'm Jack Kennedy. Who are you? And he, the man introduced himself, gave him his name. And he said, well, what do you do for NASA, sir? And the janitor replied quickly, I'm here sending a man to the moon. And I think that story is powerful because it shows that when you have complete alignment from the janitor all the way up to the president on what the mission is, you have something special that can happen. And so as a product leader, one of my first goals was to try and align our product strategy with what Blake, our CEO, wants to accomplish as a business. Blake, what's our mission? What's our vision? Why do we exist? What are we trying to accomplish? What does success looks like? All right. Let's align a corporate strategy against that mission and a subsection of that corporate strategy is product strategy. It's a very big subsection. The Venn diagram of corporate strategy and product strategy is not a circle, but it's pretty, pretty damn close. And so we create a product strategy that then leads into a bunch of initiatives that can be quarterly initiatives, year long initiatives. And those initiatives we then roll out to our product teams through uh, kind of two ways of organizing. We've got enough areas now that we decided to combine many areas into four pillars. So we have four pillars of Divi's business. And within those pillars, they've got anywhere from three to six areas, something like that. And then we take those areas and they have projects that align up against those initiatives. And then all those projects are broken down into tasks. And so you can kind of see that from the top to the bottom, every team should be able to connect their JIRA task of cleaning the toilets to the mission of getting to the moon. And of course, Divi has its getting to the moon equivalent and our strategy and our initiatives get to get there. So that's the first thing. As a product person, you should understand what, how your projects stack up against key initiatives and how those key initiatives tie into the strategy. Second thing is uh, in, in April of 2019, when I joined Divi, one of the first things Jacob Graff and I did is we sat down and said, what are our principles? Who do we want to be as a product org? And we set out with seven guiding principles as a team. I won't go into all of them today, but we decided that quality is our North Star. And by the way, if you're automatically asking, well, what does that mean? What is quality? We then break that out and say, we have five pillars of quality at Divi. And everything we ship should adhere to our five pillars of quality. It's our North Star. It is fixed. We do not negotiate against it. Speed is our second star, and we have to have both. And in a lot of ways, quality and speed actually play off of each other as opposed to being in, in constant tension, which is what the default assumption is. We're not done until it delights is the third. The fourth is, is a little harder to explain, but it simply means there are two things you need to balance as a product manager. You have a budget in terms of time and scope, and you also have an ideal experience that you could build if time and scope was not an issue. And finding the right experience is finding the right balance between that. So it's like, I have, a, I have a palace that I'm trying to build. I could imagine the ideal palace, but that palace will take two years and we don't have enough budget of two years. 
or in this metaphor, it's a billion dollars. Okay, well, maybe we need to build a two bedroom condo and that's what we're building. But regardless of the scope, meaning palace or condo, it will be quality. The condo will have great plumbing. It will work. The locks are awesome. The lighting is great. And the difference, the thing you're flexing is the scope, whether it's a palace or a condo. The fifth one, be ambidextrous, explore and exploit. This is the thing that I struggle with the most of what is the balance between making what you have better versus exploring to find new global maximums for your product. And, and I, I'll tell you my learning here is that when you think you're exploiting, you probably can do much more exploiting, especially if you found product market fit, err on the side of exploiting more and more and more. Feed the flywheel. This means understand why your product will feed off of each other and automate wherever possible. The point here is that decide what your principles are as a team. And if you don't, if your product team doesn't have principles, we have found a lot of value in aligning around these. And we talk about them in product reviews and we judge PMs against their ability to live these principles. And then the third metaphor I'll use here is the metaphor of the cul-de-sac. You can think of a, of a product as a cul-de-sac, which is simply an area of land. We take that area land and we divide it out into parcels or lots. And we assign those lots to squad leads. And the sum of those lots is the mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, entire Divi product. And so that there is an owner over that plot of land. And within that plot of land, they've got to decide what's not quality and how can they make it more quality? And what are they working on that aligns with the overall company vision? Um, the challenge here is that when you have different plots of land, how do you make it feel like one product? Because you ship your org chart, right? And so you want to be careful that what you ship to a customer, they can't tell where you've drawn area lines very easily. It feels like one experience to them. And there can be a whole conversation on how to do that. Sometimes I think we've done well at that. Sometimes I don't. But that is a challenge of the area model is that you've got to make sure that those lines that live internally to you do not make their way to the customer experience in a negative way. But we make our product areas mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. There is no, well, not one square inch of the product that is not owned by some PM engineering lead and designer. This is important for ongoing management of that part of the area. So bugs that come in, someone has to own those. That's the point of areas. I've often wondered, why do we need areas? Maybe we should just align against initiatives. And there is a component of ongoing area management that I think is crucial to any product org. Although as a side note, I just talked with the, the head of product from Airbnb during 2020. And he, he relayed the story of the, you know, the hellish nightmare that Airbnb went through in, in, in COVID in March of last year. And Brian Chesky essentially disbanded all areas. And he said, we are now one area and it's Airbnb. And we're going to decide, I'm going to decide, Brian, where what, what priorities we're working on. Get, forget about areas. We're all, we're all going against one set of five priorities. I think that's a, the, the right move probably during wartime. But during normal times, having areas provide stability, code ownership, and things like that. All right, and the last important to organize is that I strongly believe, and this is partially because my background is in sales, <clears throat> I have like a deep respect or like almost a reverence for a, a sales rep who signs up for a number. That's not an easy thing to do. You signed up for a number and you put your name next to it. And a lot of product folks aren't as comfortable with signing up for a number. And so I've tried to implement something of, uh, uh, akin to that in product of like, what's the outcome we can sign up for? And this has a natural forcing function to align us with revenue. You'll, I think at Divi see our sales, our RPMs joining sales calls. Back when we travel, they travel with, with sales reps. They're joining implementation calls. Now that's fairly common, but we've tried to really press that and do more of that. I try and talk to two customers a week minimum on Zoom and join, and join demos and calls myself. I think that <clears throat> product people have a tendency to over intellectualize product and get theoretical about what might be amazing. It's like at the end of the day, what matters is if it will sell, will the customer adopt it? Will they buy it? Will they part ways with their money? 
And really the best way to know that is to be tightly aligned with your customer success org, tightly aligned with your sales org. All right, we're in the last couple of, of principles here. How should the product org and PMs be measured? The simple answer to that is against outcomes. So on the left, you have every plot of land, which we call squads or areas. And on the right, you have outcomes against which these areas are judged. And these are internal Divi names, and I've changed them because I knew we were going to record some of this. But you know, the point here is that every area has a clear outcome against which they are judged. And that outcome has a, measure, a measurement so that we know how it's going. And those outcomes happen to tie to our company level outcomes that we set at the corporate or at the executive level of things that we need to accomplish. Things around revenue, contribution margin, retention, all of those outcomes get disseminated throughout the product org. And we try to do a good job of having every PM own the outcome. So not only do you own plots of land and it's mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, we try and own outcomes in a MISI mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive way so that they roll up to the company level. Now, that's not the only thing PMs are judged by. We also have these things called PMOPs, product management operating principles. PMOPs are the things that PMs use day to day to guide their actions, or in other words, how they operate. We have, in fact, I, what I'm gonna do is just show you them within Notion. I think maybe you'd find that more interesting. So let me, let me hop into Notion real quick. Um, all right, so our product management operating principles, this is distinct from our product principles. These are the things that a great PM should be doing, literally very applicable on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have five of them, and I'll go through all five real quick. Number one, drive outcomes for the business. That's what I just talked about. You judge a PM off of whether she can drive outcomes for the business. Number two, while shipping delightful products to our customers, but this is the means to driving outcomes for the business. It almost always requires shipping something for sure. And that what, what you ship should be delightful to customers. Number three, you better earn and maintain the trust and admiration of your peers. And we have things that we do to test this. We have squad health checks that our product ops teams run to see how happy engineers are with their product lead. Uh, we, we have other <clears throat> mechanisms in place to ensure that PMs are living this third PMOP. Number four, perfect your written and verbal communication. A PM who, who cannot communicate is a failed PM, obviously. And so we do lots of training on how to write, how to structure your thoughts. I think a lot of this is storytelling and creating a narrative of success. And then five is kind of the catch-all PMOP. It's mastering the PM fundamentals. Can you focus? Can you prioritize? Do you know how to run a meeting? Are you organized? Can you get more out of your team than it seems like you should be able to? Can you project manage? So it's funny that that, that um, spectrum I showed on the second slide between task manager and CEO. Well, you actually still have to do the project management. It's just a subset of what a great product lead does. So these are the five PMOPs that we train our entire team on. The value of having PMOPs is that this drives how you recruit. Would this person be good at our five PMOPs? Well, let's check, let's test it in the, in the interview process. It drives how you train. Is our team understanding what, uh, how, to, how this is defined in excellence on that PMOP? For example, one of the PMOPs is how to run a meeting successfully. Well, have I trained the team on what it means to run a meeting successfully? If not, I haven't defined the standard of excellence there. And so it drives how I can train the team. Again, these are the five PMOPs at the highest level, driving outcomes, shipping products, earning trust, perfecting communication, and mastering fundamentals. And the third benefit of this on top of recruiting, training, the third one is performance management. Guess what we look at every time we're trying to decide whether someone should get promoted? We look at the rubric, which is our five PMOPs. So having this as a structure in place has been a pretty important part of the playbook here at Divi. Uh, and, and I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's been successful so far. All right, and then the last one is even more tactical and that's what's the cadence that we operate in. There are a bunch of meetings that we have that are kind of standing meetings that I won't dive into in real detail. The main one I wanna focus on is product reviews. It's the crux of the operating cadence. 
the right metaphor here, continuing on with the CEO metaphor, is a product review is like a board meeting. And a board meeting is attended by senior leaders. Uh, we used to have our CEO in every product review. We've since grown out of that with the number of product reviews. And now it's really our senior engineering and product and design leaders. And then I will give a product review to our CEO every month. But product reviews serve as a board meeting for the squads to get their stuff together and show progress every two weeks. They have to get sign off on what their plan is and they have to, to, to kind of continually commit to their outcomes. This is where they're reporting on bugs, especially bugs that are older than a week old and, and performance and the number of queries that don't meet the quality pillars that I talked about. This is where we review product principles and projects. This is where design demos are given and code demos are given. And it turns into a good working session between the squads themselves and the leaders in order to make sure that every squad is operating at a high level. We've given trainings around like, here's how to do a perfect product review. And we've, we've spent a lot of time and effort trying to make sure every PM feels successful. And the same principle applies here. If this turns into the CEO board meeting, just like a real board meeting, it fails. But if it's spread across the leaders of the team, uh, that's when a product review can be successful. So I'm gonna summarize it in one slide and then I think we're, we're done for now. What's the proper role? Be product led. What's the right framing? PM as a GM, but beware. How should the product org be organized? In mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive areas with great product principles connected to the strategy and tightly aligned with revenue. How should the product org be measured against outcomes and the other four PMOPs? What's the right operating cadence? Nail product review, nail product review. And that's kind of the five components of the product playbook at Divi. I'm gonna repeat a caveat I gave earlier. Uh, uh, you know, first round writes an article, Tyler gives a presentation of product hive, man, it seems like things are really a, a, a well oiled machine. Yes and no. We have a lot of failures. We've had a lot of issues as we've done this, but we try and grow through them and evolve them. And just like any agile principle, we're not too married to the dogma of the playbook. The playbook evolves and we've gotten better over time. Um, but that's it. I would be more than happy to talk questions. Uh, and if we don't have a ton of questions, I think we'll we'll give the rest of the hour back to everybody. I hope <laughs> it's helpful. Reach out to me on Twitter uh, or on email. I'm happy to talk to any and each of you if I can be helpful. Um, and I think my last point would be thanks for making the kind of Utah product culture great. Um, I was nervous to move back to Utah. Like I said, it was a very dumb idea that I had but I've been so impressed with the talent of product people across Utah and that it's continuing to raise and raise and raise and make me better. And that's thanks to each of you and to Product Hive and the community we have here. So that's all I've got. Um, thanks again for your time. Tyler, thank you. Are there any questions from anybody? Yeah, this is uh, Jerem Tolson. I'd like to ask one if I could. Sure. <clears throat> awesome. Um, I'm a product owner at Aveta. Um, and I've, I've uh, read your article um, that you kind of highlighted today, which I think is awesome. Um, regarding like compensations as like the product manager is the general manager. I, I know that I've read some of like the highlighting that like the compensation perhaps is different as a general manager. I don't know, like I don't need not asking for specifics at Divi, but like the thought process and like how much of the compensation is led or is like uh, related to like the success of the product. I don't know if you can share um, anything there and like whether that's gone well or not gone well, stuff like that. Cause that's something we're considering adopting ourselves. Yeah. So for those who haven't read the article, it talks a lot about this experiment we had of like variable comp plans for PMs. And I would say we still do it, but it's definitely evolved and we've learned how to make it great. So the way that it's evolved is um, rather than just being based on whether or not a PM hits the number or their outcome, we're, we've now moved to a model where uh, it's, it's more formal uh, performance evaluations twice a year, and it's against these five PMOPs. The first one is the outcomes one, but the other four are now, you know, heavily weighted as well. Whereas before we had the kind of strictly variable outcome, variable compensation, just for number one, essentially, 
we've now kind of evolved our performance evaluation as a company into more of a structured uh, um, biannual process that we didn't have before. And as a result, we've maintained that emphasis on outcomes. Every PM has an outcome. Some of them are tied to like revenue and things like that and hitting, hitting a quota even. Um, but there, it's not the only thing. And it's just one, one component of five. The way we do it is, you know, we, we have these things called like, and it's, it's new as of this year, like biannual performance evaluations, um, basically equity grants based on the top performers. People who do well can get like a performance equity grant if they score well on that rubric of okay. which the number one is outcomes. Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That makes sense. No problem. Tyler, there are a couple of questions coming in on the chat, so I'll just read them out for you. Sounds good. Uh, Tyler, this is very helpful. This is from Anthony. Um, clearly a lot of thought in this over years, I'm sure. Agree with the points about product reviews, although the two-week cadence is a little scary. <laughs> yeah, so funny enough, uh, I, I was brought up in weekly product reviews, uh, and I actually pushed for that here and lost that argument. Um, part of that's just a practical reason. When you have so many squads, it's pretty hard to do a product review weekly. We now have something like 12 or 13 squads up from four, two years ago. Um, but I think two weeks is the right cadence. Now you could evolve it for you, but if your team can't show some semblance of progress in two weeks, I'm not saying you've shipped something every two weeks, although that's ideal, uh, then, then it's questionable to me whether the team's operating very well. Um, pretty dogmatic about this. I could be proven wrong, but we have stuck with two weeks now for about two years, and I think it's the right cadence. It is scary, though, and that's kind of the point. Um, a follow-up question to that is how much time is spent preparing yeah. for the product review? Yeah, so you're hinting at a challenge of this is you kind of have people like, wow, that's a lot of prep time. I wish I could just be working instead of preparing slides. So two points to that. Um, it's actually a common concern that CEOs have for board meetings. Gosh, I hate preparing for the board meeting. I wish I could just run the business. Well, the answer to that is a very good board meeting is a forcing function for you to make sure you're running the business well. And so the work of preparing for product reviews is the work. The way to have a great product review is to have a great two weeks of work. It's to win the week. And so, yes, it does take some time to prepare, but product review is collaborative. It's less, it's not, I've probably conveyed it to be this stodgy board meeting thing, and it maybe used to be more of that. It's more collaborative now on here's our plan, here's our struggles, here's where we're blocked. Tyler, can you help us here? Uh, it's raising yellow flags. It's not a, a dogmatic, you know, suits and tie board meeting, even though that's the metaphor I've used. It's pretty pragmatic. Awesome. Uh, another question here from, from Buck Magnum, Ma Mangum. Uh, which are the most crucial deliverables that change hands? Example, PM to design to de de developers, et cetera. Crucial deliverables that change hands. Um, Buck, are, are you there? Could you just explain that one a little bit? I can take a stab at it. So we, you know, if I miss the mark, let me know. But we don't really think of it in terms of these handoffs as much, although there is a literal handoff, right, between design and engineering. If we're doing it well, engineering's involved in the discovery and we're pulling them forward to the problem. You know, I, I don't like this fallacy of like PMs figure out the problem and then hand it off to the designer. The designer figures out the UX and then hands it off to to engineering. I don't like that. Aligned with this engineering uh, empowerment outset, I think engineers should be involved in understanding the problem up front and should be on customer discovery calls and should be helping design think through different options. Otherwise, what you run into is like these designers have built the palace and the engineers like, uh, we don't have two years for the palace. We've got to get this out and our budget's two weeks. And you have this like fumble to use your handoff analogy. The way to avoid the fumble is to scrum all along the way, right? And to keep people involved from the earliest get-go. Awesome. Another one here from Sahil. 
you mentioned product design and product marketing roll up to product as well. Are they measured, organized, et cetera, in similar fashions to PMs? And how do you manage ownership between those ladders? Yeah, so every area has the core three, design lead, engineering lead, and product lead. Uh, and then there's a fourth one that we just have fewer of, and that's product marketing. We only have three product marketers in 14 areas, so you know, 12 areas. You split that off as, as you would. Um, so the, the, the real thing is like you kind of manage the area against these squad leads, not just PMs. But I was very focused on PMs today just because it was kind of a product-centric talk. But the same principles apply to design. So, for example, our director of design, Chris Higley, has created PDOPS, Product Design Operating Principles. And he manages the design team against the five PDOPS. And product marketing has the PMOPS, <laughs> Product Marketing Operating Principles. Uh, so anyway, we do very similar things across all functions is the short answer. Okay, hey, we have a live question uh, from Anar. Hey, yeah, thanks, Ashley. Uh, Tyler, awesome talk. Probably one of the best webinars I've been to, honestly, very informative. Um, I'm over here from Product Hive LA, uh, product manager at Patient Pop here in Santa Monica. Um, so your title uh, is explicitly uh, mentions, you know, GM. Um, and I feel like one of the core tenants of being a general manager is sort of PL management and capitalization. And you didn't really get into that in your talk. Um, so I just wanted to get sort of a sense of, you know, how you think a PM is or could be involved in that, either at Divi specifically or, you know, more generally. Yeah, strictly speaking, that part of being a GM is not how it works at Divi, meaning our PMs do not own the PL over a business unit. However, they certainly lean that way. Let me give you an example. Even though our head of, uh, we, we have an, a pillar called AP management. It has a bill pay product. Even though that's not a separate business unit, that team has outcomes that tie to our financial model. And so the, just yesterday, I don't know if he's on the call. His name is Andrew. Our head of AP management met with our head of finance on what assumptions are embedded in our company model that his area, his pillar is going to drive, including revenue and adoption and spend metrics. And so while he is not the explicit owner over a business unit of the PL, he's working very closely with finance in order to make sure that what he's shipping aligns with what the model says. So it's it's a kind of a it's leaning that direction, even though it's not a business unit model. Gotcha. Anyway. Thank you. No problems. I see a bunch of other questions here. I can read through them if you want. I've got it pulled up. Or okay, you... perfect. Yeah, go for it, Tyler. Jason asks, you have the core four, PMM, PM Engine, and UX. What role does data analytics have in the PM org? How many engineers QA do you have on each team? So within each squad, we have, you know, a full squad has product engineers and QA. And a full squad's probably going to be anywhere from like five to 12 engineers if you include you know, QA2. Data analytics can join these squads. So we have data engineers and we have data analysts that will be subject matter experts on certain squads that that will that'll actually join squads and, and implement work that's specific to what our data team needs to do. But they report up through engineering still, uh, typically. All right, Dave asks, can you speak a bit more about the relationship between product and technology at Divi, both the senior leadership and on the teams? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Greg Larson is our head of engineering. He runs all of technology at Divi. That's IT, QA, product development, uh, and security. And he and I, just the same principle at the squad level. If he and I are not aligned, you know, we're dead. And so Greg and I have, I believe, a very good relationship. Greg's a, Greg's a great leader, uh, and I think we have to start there. If Greg and I are tightly aligned on our outcomes, on our roadmap, then our squads can be. Uh, and, and our engineers, like I said, like they should be the star of the show, and Greg should be the one that is uh, kind of driving a lot of this. And I know that seems counter to the PM as the GM model, but hopefully I explain that nuance early on. Uh, on the teams, it's the same thing. So the squad level has an engineering lead, a product lead, a design lead. Uh, plus one to Dave A's question, which I think we answered. I'm just scrolling up to make sure. Maybe not. 
Yeah, I think the next question is from Chris McKenzie. John, yep, I agree with you, Buck. You're welcome. Okay, Chris, how do you see internal products that have PM support? Yeah, we haven't done great here. And if you talk to our success team, they'd be like, yeah, we, we still have a lot of duct tape that we have to do manually. And so one of our product principles of automate everything, uh, that's probably the one that is less, like it's still more aspirational than I want it to be. But that being said, we're getting better here. Some of our areas include internal tools. Like we have an internal tool called Houston. Um, the way that we've divided that out actually is not one area owns Houston. It's divided out over parts of Houston are owned by different teams. But I think this is a challenge. I don't have a great answer for it. The internal products do need to live within an area in order to meet that MISI principle. But we haven't, we haven't crushed it here. Awesome. Does Greg think you have a good relationship, Tyler? Yes, I believe so, but you should ask him. Uh, Greg, Greg is phenomenal. If you guys haven't met him, he is he's a great, great, great engineering leader. What trade-offs do you make at early startup stages with limited resource without sacrificing the core product objective role? Um, I don't think I understand the question. So Nicholas, DM me or you know, send me a tweet. What trade-offs do you make at early startup stages with limited resources? without sacrificing the core product objective role. Yeah, I'm not sure. That one's tough to answer without knowing specifics. Internal products like Cobbler's Children. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, can you speak to the four pillars concept? How do you know when you break out products into groupings? Sure. So this, this, this pillar uh, concept came out of our strategy, right? Divi's following a pretty aggressive and ambitious strategy. We're trying to be the you know, what Salesforce was to sales and, and marketing leaders, we want to be for, for finance leaders. If you're spending, we want it to flow through Divi. We want it to be the hub, the platform for a finance leader to rely on for every SMB in America. And that's a big vision. And so in order to do that, there's some products that we're replacing. We're trying to replace Expensify and Concur. We're trying to replace their core card program at American Express. And we're trying to explore, uh, replace Bill.com. And it turns out if you do that well, there's some really cool flywheels that, that you can ha unlock when you consolidate them into one platform. And that's what, what Divi's trying to do. The pillars are our internal way of organizing around that strategy. And we also use it for product marketing for our clients to kind of consume how Divi's product is organized. Engineers and designers dedicated to specific parts of the product as well. Has it always been that way? Yeah, that's the whole area concept. So if I go back to uh, this, one plot of land equals one area and one area has a squad and that squad is comprised of the core three or four plus you know five to 10 engineers and they are dedicated to that area. We've introduced a new concept just this month called flex squads as opposed to core squads. I don't know if others of you have ran into this problem of you want core stability on the core parts of your product because code ownership is real, but you also want as a product leader, the ability to flex given changing priorities and move engineers as needed. That's a hard problem to solve. And the way that we've solved it is we've created specific squads to fill both of those functions. One is called a core squad. You're fixed within that area. You are not moving. One is called a flex squad. You do like a, a quarterly tour of duty to try and accelerate the roadmap or accelerate certain initiatives. And it tends to attract engineers who are wanting a new flavor every quarter or every six months, as opposed to some engineers who hate that. They prefer to stay. And it allows people to self-select into the type of team that they want. This is a new experiment that we're starting that Greg actually is driving. And I'm pretty optimistic that it'll, it'll help us be a little more flexible than we've been. Awesome. Tyler, thank you so much. Okay, I will take this one as the last question and then we'll uh, we'll uh, get to the draw. Yeah, so how do we train our PMs? No, no need to apologize. So let's go back to these PMOPs, right? These PMOPs, all five of them have like 10 sub principles. Master the PM fundamentals. Well, what are those? There's like 10 PM fundamentals. So we take those and we turn them into trainings. And myself and Gentry Davies, who leads all of product management right now, will create trainings that we hope 
allow us to define the standard of excellence on that PMOP so that we can then judge people against it. Because until I define it, how can, they, how can they be judged against it? The best example is this, the 10 commandments of perfect product reviews. This is a training we gave almost you know, 18 months ago and that we refer to quite often on what it means to have a perfect product review. This is the standard of excellence. And having a good product review is one of the PMOPs. It's underneath PM fundamentals and written verbal communication. Hope this is helpful, guys. Uh, thanks, thanks for the time. Reach out if you have other questions. I, I, I've had fun.